Mr. Rice from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your service to our country and your willingness to take on this very profound and important role. Uh, it was reported over the weekend that President Trump's chief political strategist, Stephen Bannon, uh, told you not to issue a waiver exempting green card holders from the travel ban. Uh, some of the details of that report have since been called into question, and others have been denied by the White House. But I figure since I have you in front of me, I would just ask you directly, um, did that happen? Did that conversation take place? You know, I, I read that, um, uh, that article uh, um, Saturday morning, and uh, my, um, well, I would tell you that every paragraph, every sentence, every word, every space, every comma, every period was wrong. Uh, it, it, it was a fantasy story, and uh, my, my concern to my public affairs people was, look, this, this reporter, whoever he is, got this so wrong that assuming he's not making it up, uh, you got to get to him and tell him whoever his sources are are playing him for a fool. I don't know if they did that, but it's untrue. So uh, he, Steve Bannon did not ask you um, the entire, not to issue the entire the story is untrue. So do you have concerns about, just objectively, in your new role, do you have concerns about political operatives trying to influence the work of the Department of Homeland Security? No. I work for one man. His name is you know, Donald Trump, obviously. He has told me, Kelly, secure the border, and that's what I'll do. I am mildly interested in what political people think about that mission. Well, actually, you were chosen by him. You work for us. You work for the American people, first and foremost. I'm we sure all that, work for I'm the, sure that's what you we meant. We all work for the American people. Um, as secretary, what are you doing to ensure that your leadership, because clearly had you been involved in creating this executive order, you would have pointed out the issue with the visa holders and all of that. What are you doing to make sure that this kind of a, if you want to call it a rollout or preparation of an executive order, if they're going to continue in the future, that you have some input in the area that you clearly have expertise in. Yeah, I was involved uh, uh, tangentially in the writing of it. So the point, uh, the, the reporting that I, I never saw it didn't have anything to do with is untrue. We, we had a very small number of people in Homeland Security working with the White House as they developed it. I think in retrospect, um, as I, I think I pointed out a li little earlier, but for sure have had discussions with members of Congress, both sides of the Hill, both sides of the aisle, that uh, a better way to have rolled that out, uh, and we will do this in the future, will be to engage uh, more fully at least the leadership of, of the, uh, the House and Senate initially uh, and roll it in, and then immediately after, as we start to execute, um, meet with additional members of the, of the, of the House and the, uh, and the Senate. So, yeah, I mean, lesson learned on me. I should have slowed it down by a day, maybe two. Um, probably would not have put it out, uh, you know, exactly on a Friday the way we did. But I was uh, knowledgeable of the writing of it. I saw it at, uh, twice, Tuesday and I think Thursday. Knew full well it was going to be released on a Friday. So, again, there's an awful lot of misreporting, and I'll... I'll, I'll assume that the, that the members of the press that got it wrong got it wrong because they were relying on people who were giving them information who didn't know. There is a lot to go on in terms of trying to interpret the meaning behind the executive order. We have about 18 months of comments by candidate Donald Trump about his desire to institute a ban on Muslims entering the country. His language was unequivocal and very clear. Um, I understand now you're using the frame or the uh, term uh, temporary pause. Um, but I think one of the reasons why it is interpreted to be an outright ban is because it came, the executive order did not speak to or suggest ways that the vetting process, which we already know is one of the most rigorous there is, could be made better. The executive order was void of any suggestion on how that could be. So as you sit here now um, and you talk about the need to now the desire is to make the vetting process better. What ways would you recommend, since you were really left with nothing other than an order that 
rightfully, in my opinion, it's not because I'm not saying this because I'm a Democrat, um, but we have a lot to go on in terms of, of interpreting the um, meaning behind this, especially since the order was void of any suggestions. Well, first, I, I don't have to tell you there's a lot of things that are spoken about in, in campaigns that uh, once you get in the seat, uh, you, uh, just like in my case, I mean, sitting here in, the, in a job that I'd never had before, I'm looking at life fairly, you know, differently. I thought we could accomplish things coming into this job that I realize now will be a little slower or whatever. So, uh, again, he said what he said in the, in the campaign. He has tasked me to, to protect the southwest border, get control of it, which I, which I will, of course, do. Oh, can, I just, can I just stop because there's one other question I want to see. So I, I trust that you will bring to us suggestions on how you will make the vetting process right. better. Okay. Um, one other thing. Yesterday, President Trump suggested that the, um, quote, very, very dishonest press doesn't adequately report terrorist attacks. Do you believe that statement? I think the press gets, gets, uh, does the best job. Responsible press do the best job they can to get the facts straight. But of course, um, they will go with the story. It's what they do. It's their job. They will go with the story and the best information they have. Uh, much of the world is uh, is aflame today, and we know tremendous amounts of things about what's going on. But it's in the classified realm, and that is not shared with the press. Consequently, they do the, I think that generally the best job they can. But in my mind, having worked with the press a great deal, the most responsible press won't go with a story or will write it in such a way that they they will acknowledge that they don't have the definitive information. There's a lot of other questions you've asked me, but, uh, you know, again, Mr. Chairman, we're way over, I think. Well, you, you can't blame the press for not knowing about not classified blamed. information that not. they're not you know, privy to. Uh, but do you, do you know what terrorist attacks, just last, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, please, what terrorist attacks President Trump was referring to when he said that? Yes or no? I don't know which ones, okay. which ones he was referring to. Thank you very much. The time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Rice. I recognize the gentleman from New York, uh, Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'd like to align myself with the comments of my colleague, uh, Ms. Watson Coleman from New Jersey. As you know, uh, New York has one of the most extensive public transportation systems in the world. And I'm glad to hear that that, that surface transportation is a priority for you. And I would like to join with my colleague to speak with you in the, going forward as to what, you know, the results of your analysis that you were presently doing. Yes, so uh, I, th I think the other thing that you're doing is placing a focus on the morale of the employees. It has, in the short time that I've been here in three years, it is a persistent problem, regardless of who sits in your chair and who holds your position. And you can understand why. They seem to, you know, get fewer resources, fewer accolades, fewer that of boys, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm glad to hear that you are focusing on the morale. Um, but I think that one thing that if you speak to employees, they would want to make sure that you have their back. And a lot of that has to do with are you in a position, do you feel like you can tell the president or anyone in the administration that you need certain things, that policies that they are putting in place are maybe not best for the national security, domestic security of our country. Um, and to that end, I don't know if this is something that everyone who has to go through, who's, who's a, uh, appointed um, and has to go through um, some kind of uh, confirmation process, do you have to, were you required to take any kind of loyalty oath to the president and or the administration? No, ma'am. I was not required to take any loyalty oath, and, and I did go through a confirmation process with two Senate committees. So what would you tell employees? I mean, if you are doing this analysis of surface transportation and you're looking at all the other issues that people have, my colleagues have raised here, if you, if something came up short, do you feel that you have the ability to say that? publicly and ask for more resources from either Congress or the administration through administrative action that you may want to take? 
You know, my, my job is to advocate for transportation security and advocate for it strongly and advocate for uh, our employees having the right tools and the right number of people and the right training to do their jobs. Uh, I advocate for that as the budgets are being built uh, inside the administration. So right now we're working on the fiscal 19 budget. You know, my job is to be their strongest advocate in that process to make sure that we get uh, the resources that we need to do our jobs. Um, however, you know, it, 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 you, you, I'm never going to get all of the resources uh, that I need. I don't think any agency leader would, would say that's the case. There are trade-offs that, that are made uh, within budget limits. And so, you know, my job working with the Secretary is to make sure that those trade-offs, if they need to be made, are made considering the urgency of the requirements we have in TSA. Well, I mean, you really, your, your workforce is the first line of defense. Right. Um, so I'm glad that you recognize that. Oh, just final question. What is, how, how long have you been in this position? Almost three months. Do you feel like it's a lifetime? No, no. <laughs> uh, what, what would you say are your two or three biggest challenges as you see them in the short time that you have been there? If I could just make one suggestion, your predecessor, um, Secretary Neffinger, was, had a big focus on trying to increase the morale among mm -hmm. your right. the workforce. And he, I would just ask you, and I, I don't know if you've spoken to him, to, yeah, yeah. which I think would be a great resource, but he um, put a focus on training, giving additional, like, ongoing training right. for, right? I don't know if you've continued that or if you've chosen to change that yes, training of the workforce. That, that's great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. You. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins.